Troy Major, worked for Rice Extension, have done for about eight years. So it's working with rice growers all over the MIA Murray Valley and Western Murray Valley. Uh, prior to that, I did some extension with the dairy industry. And yeah, we do uh, own a mixed irrigation farm at Logie Bray. So yeah, currently cropping and, and rice at the minute um, is our main summer crop. So yeah, through the rice extension program, we got, it was particularly uh, in the dry years, so it was uh, seven, uh, 18, 19 uh, season. People were saying, what's the most successful businesses look like in the Murray Valley? So that was a lot about, do they own water entitlements? Do they um, you know, have mixed livestock? Do they have big farms, small farms? So they're really asking this question about, that we understood there was lots of variability with our water allocations, but you know, which business was the most successful through the good times and the bad times. So through that, um, yeah, I had a bit of experience with some benchmarking with RMCG, in particular, um, Daryl Poole. So I touched base with him, said, what can you do? How, how can you help us? So what we did was, what RMCG did is revise the old um, BizCheck program. Hands up if you participated that in that program. Yep. So we just really updated it because we did look at some other benchmarking programs and a lot of the commercial benchmarking programs just can't handle irrigation water and the, the, how the um, two se uh, seasons go over a financial year. So it's a, really, it's a real challenge for the commercial benchmarking programs out there. How do you deal with um, crops that go over a uh, financial year and, and allocations and variability and that sort of stuff. So, so we revised that, um, that our task was to try and get 20 farms uh, to benchmark, put all in, in all their data. Uh, we weren't quite that successful. We did get uh, some assistance from the Rural Financial um, Counselling Service to get a few more on board. But what we did end up with is uh, about 14 businesses. Um, so yeah, and we thought we'll put this program together. So it was two parts, develop and deliver some future water workshops, which I'm pretty sure Rob will touch on a lot of that work that we discussed um, in them workshops. And the second part was these business health checks, as I said. So, so the aim was to provide insight into how they, those businesses responded to different um, allocations, different seasons, understand the drivers to success and give the farmers involved a better understanding of their current position and how they stacked up against their peers or other people within the Murray Valley. So first step was we had to look at where are we now. So we had to collect some information. We went from the 16-17 season, which was obviously very wet. We had 100% allocation that year. The average um, temporary water price was $63, megalitre, uh, $63 a megalitre. All these averages were the average of the MIL water exchange. So that was our source of data for that. So 17, 18, which was a dry year, 18, 19, which obviously had 0% allocation, and 19, 20, we had that late 3% allocation. I think we got it in May or something like that. So, so as you can see that from the data we collected, we had good seasons, average seasons, and very poor seasons. So that was uh, the data we collected. What did we collect? Uh, area, simple things about area, water use, crops grown, livestock, income, our costs, our inventories that we held over or from season to season, how they change, assets and liabilities. So briefly, what did we analyse? Uh, where the water had been used, calculation of farm income. And this was working out the uh, true income derived from that farm from that year. So, not, so it was the match, um, all the costs and income with one financial year. So we, particularly with rice, as we know, we get payments in the second and third year. So it was to pull all them into one year to see whether that year was profitable or not. So it took a bit of doing. Uh, the productivity measures were whole of farm, irrigation, dollars per hectare and dollars per meg, et cetera, et cetera. And then we went to capital performance and viability. So we did a few, yeah, uh, measurements and benchmarking. So of the 14 enterprises that were involved, not all of them did the whole four years because we did um, do this in, uh, in 2021. So 
to look back at historical um, records. We all aren't good at keeping records of our farm management practices, so it was a bit difficult for some. So not everyone did the four years, but. So the range of farms was from yeah, 290 hectares to 5,230 hectares. So we had a good range, good spread of farms. Of them farms, the irrigation development was from 9% to 96% of the land area. And the maximum water use in a good year of these farms was 619 megs to 6,466. So a real, just to try and show you, there was a real breadth of um, of participants we had, and that's what we really wanted. We really wanted to look at each end of the scale. So, uh, and yeah, obviously extensive livestock to minimal, and mostly of them livestock had sheep. So just yeah, a little bit more insight into the um, farms. You can see the water percent of total assets range from just a little bit under 45% down to uh, 16%. So that's that top graph, so they're, they're the farms, the numbers of, represent a farm. So yeah, so if someone had like the 45%, if he had two million in total assets, he had about $900,000 worth of water made up that portfolio. So, so there was a fair spread, and it just indicates what we all know in Murray Irrigation, now not every farm's the same. So some have lots of water, some have less. The equity, uh, so just, yeah, there's obviously a couple just a touch under 100%, and then down to as little as or the 60% equity. So we had a good range there. Um, yeah, obviously there is farms out there with less equity, but we didn't capture that in our, our data. But it's still, once again, a pretty good range. So what do we observe from all this? Uh, generally, net worth, um, we had growth in all, most farms, well, just about all farms. Why is that over that period? So we're thinking from 1617 to 2021, what's happened? Water a little bit. Had the drought, had the drought. Yeah, yeah but what's really gone up? What's helped us? Land prices and livestock prices have really skyrocketed since then. So that really helped everyone. So as you can see, some, you know, the, someone had 50% net worth growth over them four years. So amazing, which we, I'm pretty sure, you know, land was selling for, Eighteen hundred dollars an acre around here, and we thought that was expensive. Now it's selling for thirty-four hundred. You know, it's just gone up that quick. So that's reflected in these results. Uh, equity has been protected, even though we had some difficult seasons. So yeah, remember in them in them four years, we had two years of zero allocation, so it was pretty protected. And there obviously was operating losses incurred, but the com combination of our appreciation and returns resulted in improvement of net wealth. Rob. Jump in if, uh, if I've missed anything or you've got something to add. Um, so also what was observed, there was a big range of income per megalitre um, from rice crops. So we can see there's a, you know, it ranges from 475. So this is purely income, 475 per meg down to $250. And that's important and you'll see a little bit later. So. Yeah, they're just different rice crops and how much revenue they generated per megalitre. So that's, we all know that. that there's, like years as well. yeah. yeah, so there's really only two years that rice was grown. Yeah, um, yeah it is. What's across the bottom of the scale? Uh, the number of rice crops, so there was 25 oh, okay. rice crops so, so within individual that. Individual well, is that over that period of time? Yeah, so some, obviously, yeah. only probably four people grew two rice crops in that period, and obviously, 12, or it might have been a bit more than that, but yeah. Not everyone grew um, two rice crops. Um, yeah, so some people might have grown a crop every year, some yep. people might have had a couple of years out. But that's, that's it. The total of yeah. crops. Yep. Uh, farm viability, so they, yeah, what did we find? Uh, total assets varied uh, amongst these, this, this group of farmers from 2 million to 12 million. <laughs> Data suggests that for farm viability, you need in order of about $3 million in assets per household, or you can have two million in assets per household. So remember that word, per household. So if that's just mum and dad, but if you've got you know, uh, two kids on the farm as well, well, that's another two million each for them. So that two million, that's the off-farm income had to be regular and it had to be pretty substantial, I guess. And th that scale enables about 200,000 
plus farm profit per household, which allows you to live, pay debt, pay tax and reinvest in the farm. Uh, so responsiveness, I guess, what did the good people, how did the better farms respond? There's a focus on not going backwards in the hard years, making decisions early and knowing when to sell and making the good times count. So out of the 14, we sort of split them up into three different groups. Those that perform really well, average and below average. The characteristics of the, those that perform very well had four to five percent return on capital in good years, minimised losses in bad years. Uh, once again, they're a mixture of big and small. So if you're asking that answer, it's not about how big or how small you are. A mix of production systems. Once again, there's no one answer. Yeah, you'll better keep going. So what did they do? Well, this group one, they were buyers and sellers of water. That really stood out. So they bought when they could and sold when they should. So certainly in years like this year, they're buying a lot. If it's a 0% you know, allocation year, they're selling. They respond to the season, not set in what they, what they do, very flexible in their planning. Strong cost and control, less than 60% operating costs in good years, low machinery costs, Good production, so once again, this little pointer doesn't work. Good production, so their rice income was greater than $350 per megalitre. So remember that one. Income was higher, uh, costs were low, above average production. No one gets it all right all the time, but this group got it right most of the time. So our second group had, so they had a good return in the good years, but they went backwards in the, in the two drought years um, on return on capital. Uh, tended not to sell water and sometimes bought water and moderate rice production. So a couple of points. The third group, which didn't do that well, so only had a zero to 1% return on capital in good years and went backwards in the bad years. Once again, mix of farms. They sold water during the bad years, but didn't capitalise when it's good, when there's lot, water's plentiful. That was the main difference. And obviously while their net worth uh, increased over time, changes required. Obviously, what can we do better? Know your cost of production to develop your cost triggers. That's about that buying and selling water. Know your cost of production when you should buy and sell. Go hard when water is affordable. Make decisions to cut losses early during poor seasons. Know your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, size can help, as we said. Asset growth has saved us all. There's no recipes. Know your business and look to learn from others. So there is no one rule for all of us, whether you have lots of water, big farm, small farm, livestock or not. Um, and once, yeah, if you got through this period, you're well placed to tackle the future. In simple terms, in simple terms, and I presume you might touch on this too, Rob. If water, if it's a wet year and water's at 75 bucks, it's great value to the rice farmer. If it's average, uh, like 17, 18, we had 50% um, allocation. That it's uh, $180 was the average water price, and it's a max value. And I'll show you that in a minute. That rice can pay, very dry, etc. So, right, so this is where, so this is a gross margin of uh, rice, and I'll probably just go to this next one, which is per megalitre. So, what we say, so this is based on 13, using 13 megs a hectare, and, um, you know, purchase water. So, what we can see from this matrix is, to where we said we topped out at the 187 is 11 tonne and four twenty dollars a tonne. So, so down on our, the column here is our yield and across there is the price of rice. So 13 megs at, the, at $400 price, the return is going to be $144 per megalitre. So that's at full contract prices. So that's where you so obviously if you do it yourself, if you harvest and all that, you're going to have reduced costs. So your gross margin will go up a little bit. To give you an indication, and I actually did these in March when we were originally going to do the, um, this workshop. And it's funny what has changed. So since then, I used 10 as an average um, yield. That was on the back of um, Rizik, which is about five year average for here. We've now got a new variety called VO71. I just looked at the data this morning. It's averaging about 12 tonne for the whole valley. So, 
So it's a big step change. So that's where we can, we'll get a higher return per megalitre. We'll get down past, you know, $200 a meg. But generally it's that 183 is about the max out. So I wouldn't be relying on that 12 tonne year in, year out. We've had an exceptional year. But that's where, yeah. And so this is done. 420? Yep. Yeah, 420. And obviously that helps as we go, yeah. So the, the price guidance for this year's crops, 390 to 440, I think, or 430, but around that 440. So, um, yeah, but obviously if you get less yield, you're not doing as good. We all know well, that. We're not saying that's what we can afford to pay for water. We're saying that if we grow a crop with water, that's the return. Like for every megalitre we put into it, that's the return yep. we'll get. Yep. So then if you're going into the market to buy water, you've got to factor that in and see whether you, you know, if you're yep. happy to... So th that's where I've done here, Dave. So I've bought water for $50. My return is 132 megs. So if I can get it cheaper, my return, obviously we're gonna buy it for 20 and Rob's gonna tell us how much we're gonna pay next year. So I can get it for 20 bucks and I do 10 ton, which is that five year average for a receipt, 162. So I've paid for me water plus I get 100. Likewise, if I come up and if I pay $80, I'm gonna get 103 at that 10 ton. But if I grow 71 and it goes well, I'm up to 130, 143. So that's just showing the impact on the price of temporary water that we pay. But just going back to here. So remember, so in the analysis, we come up with that figure of 185. So this is just a gross margin and it really lines up with that figure. So we're all on the same page. Um, I guess one's theoretical. Well, it wasn't theoretical. It was, yeah taking in account of um, that data, and this just really proves it. So, uh, any questions? So this is also just a summary of how our, our gross margins can change. So as I said, the first one is using VA71 full con contract rates. The next one's owner rates. So all I do that is I halve the cost for harvesting cartage and just your operations. So you can get a higher gross margin of 174 Likewise, as I said, this is using 13 megs. If we use, this year we use less water. So if we use 11 megs, that gross margin would go up to $200 a meg. Uh, and then VA71 with future input prices. So the first one that was using urea at $1,500 MAP, because that's how much it was in March. This next one's using $1,000 for them and Roundup's a bit cheaper. I think might have put nine bucks, etc. So it does, ha it has a, impact. I guess what I want to demonstrate here is you can get, water will have more impact on your gross margin than whether your is 1500 or a thousand bucks. It just doesn't change as much. Uh, yep, so that's pretty much all I had to share. That, as I said, that's the outcomes of, the, um, of our little pilot project. That's what we found. So there's no, sorry, there's no answer, you know, but the, I guess the key learning is about water. You know, you've got to know when to trade and when to hold them and when to fold them, I guess, John, is that the thing?